I'm Professor Sue Walker. Um, I'm a Professor of Maternal Fetal Medicine, which is a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynaecology. So once you're an obstetrician and gynaecologist, you do a further three years in subspecialty training, which is just looking after the highest risk pregnancies, I guess, in the country. So mums who are sick, for example, who've got cancer or heart disease or kidney disease, but also dealing with babies who may have problems detected while they're unborn or who are at high risk of complications in the pregnancy, such as preterm birth or high blood pressure and so forth. So I work at the Mercy Hospital for Women. I'm the Sheila Hanbury Chair of Maternal Fetal Medicine, um, which is a named chair um, and the generous support of Jeff Hanbury and his family. It's named after his mum. So it's a very special appointment um, and I'm lucky to hold that position because it gives me the opportunities to work both in developing excellence in clinical care, but also in teaching and research. And I also hold appointments at the Royal Women's Hospital and Monash Medical Centre where we do some of the fetal surgery. Um, so excellence in clinical care, I guess, means putting the mother, the baby, the family at the centre of care. And I think that this extends right from the time prior to pregnancy in families who are planning a pregnancy to give them the best advice going forward for having a healthy baby. But it also involves careful care during the pregnancy, particularly to identify families who may have a higher risk of complications during pregnancy because there are sometimes interventions that we can offer that can be helpful for reducing the risk of a poor outcome and helping to support the mum and the baby through that. And this extends then of course through the time of labour and delivery and into the postnatal period as the family transitions into welcoming the newborn to home. Screening during pregnancy is sometimes quite a charged term, but I guess I'd like to perhaps orient people to what we mean by screening. So screening in medicine and indeed in pregnancy means that you apply a test to a population where you are trying to identify a high risk group of the adverse outcome that you're looking for with the aim to improving that outcome. If we even go back to the 1960s, Wilson and Jungner have come up with what we call the screening criteria. So when you do a screening test, it's important that's a test that the population understand and accept. It's for a disorder that is either very common or very important. That the screening test accurately identifies people at risk. That we have a reliable diagnostic test, that is a test to rule out what we call the false positives, the people who are falsely alarmed by that test. And that we have a meaningful intervention as a result of the screening. So for example, screening in pregnancy, we screen all pregnant women for lots of things. We do a blood count at the beginning of pregnancy because if we identify someone's got a low blood count, we know that's associated with an increased risk of preterm birth or problems with the baby's growth. And identifying that early in pregnancy allows us that effective intervention time to recover that before it causes those adverse consequences. We screen all pregnant women for HIV in pregnancy. Even though the incidence of women living with HIV who are undiagnosed at the beginning of pregnancy is very low in Australia. But nevertheless, if you diagnose someone with HIV in pregnancy, there are very important interventions that we can put in place to reduce the chance of the deadly mother to child transmission of HIV. So if we take those two examples, I guess what people often talk about concerns with prenatal screening is particularly screening for abnormalities in the baby. So prenatal genetic screening or screening for structural abnormalities. So in the middle part of pregnancy, women will be offered at every hospital the opportunity to have a screening examination of the pregnancy and the baby. And at that examination, commonly done around about 20 weeks, we find out important things that will make a huge difference on how we manage the pregnancy. For example, at that ultrasound, as well as having a careful look at the baby, we make sure that there's not a multiple pregnancy. We will miss 10% of twins at the beginning of labour if we don't know that the second one's there. That's very dangerous for the second twin. We will check the location of the placenta. If a pregnancy's got a low-lying placenta, that mother is at small risk of life-threatening hemorrhage and it's important for us to give her advice and come up with management for the time of delivery. It also gives us an opportunity to look for structural abnormalities in the baby. So when we do these scans, we do a careful look of brain, face, lips, nose, spine, 
arms, legs, heart, chest, tummy, kidneys, bladder, three vessel cord and so on. And it gives us an opportunity to identify if the baby may have a structural abnormality that may have important implications for the pregnancy. It may have important implications for the timing, the place, the mode of delivery. And of course, all families want to know what important out health outcomes it may have for their baby. So for example, we would do an, a, a mid-trimester ultrasound examination and we may detect that the baby has, for example, something like spina bifida. It would be important for us to talk to that family about why we sometimes see spina bifida in babies to assess if there are any other associated problems that might be important for that baby's long-term health. In addition, we know that there are things that can occur in pregnancies complicated by spina bifida that if we know about them in advance, we can try and prevent. For example, the development of too much fluid around the baby. And you may be aware that there's pioneering work on fetal surgery for the unborn for conditions like spina bifida, where it's been shown to reduce the risk of death or handicap at the age of two. It'll be important for that family to know that they perhaps shouldn't deliver at Kilmore Hospital a place where they perhaps don't have the neonatal resources to manage a baby who will need very, uh, very intensive su surveillance and care as soon as it's born, right until the time that it's transferred to the children's hospital for definitive surgery. The opportunity to know about a baby affected with spina bifida has a huge impact on a patient and their family as they get to meet the paediatrician the geneticist who can walk them through some of the genetic associations, as they get to meet the surgeon at the children's hospital who may ultimately be responsible for the care of their baby when it comes to surgery, and as they get to meet the team who will be looking after them in our hospital during their pregnancy, through the labour and delivery, and at the time of early neonatal transition. So I guess that's the screening that we would do for, if you like, structural abnormalities in the baby. But of course there is a related area where there may be a genetic or a chromosomal problem with the baby that mightn't be reliably detected with ultrasound. All the pregnant women out there would recognise that they are routinely offered screening for genetic conditions that might be important for them to know about during the pregnancy. I guess the one we most commonly think about is screening for Down syndrome. So trisomy 21 is the most common chromosomal abnormality that results in live birth. And infants born with Down syndrome have important health risks for the remainder of their, for the remainder of their life that it's important for families to be aware of. Screening tests for Down syndrome in the past used to rely on a very crude measure of risk, what we used to call advanced maternal age. We used to define advanced maternal age as over the age of 37, which is becoming laughable with the increasing age of the maternal population. But the sensitivity of that detection, that is, the number of babies that were reliably detected as having Down syndrome, for the number of diagnostic tests, that is things like amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, was really unacceptable. We ended up doing too many invasive tests and putting too many healthy pregnancies at risk. And so this is why our hospital, as all hospitals, will offer screening tests that have what we call the lowest false positive rate. That is, we want it to have a high sensitivity, a high detection rate, but we also want it to have a low false positive rate. So we are avoiding doing invasive tests that pose a tiny risk to the pregnancy, but we are nevertheless doing those in as few pregnancies as possible. So there are a variety of screening tests available for Down syndrome. And I think in any genetic screening context, what is crucially important is pre-test counselling. We need to individualise with every family what it is that they want to know about the pregnancy. There are some families who say, look, I would actually never want that information before my baby's born. I think it could upset me during the pregnancy. I would never want to proceed with a diagnostic test. I would never want the certainty of knowing one way or another. I just want to meet my baby when it's born. And that should be absolutely respected. But many families will say, I would like to have that information available to me so that I can plan the future for the pregnancy. 
And we would absolutely support that in our Catholic hospital as in any hospital because we know that this provides the best available care for women during their pregnancy. Now, there are advantages to the baby as well in knowing in advance if it's affected by a chromosomal condition such as Down syndrome. When we know in advance that a pregnancy is affected by Down syndrome, then there are a suite of things that we can put in place for families who are continuing the pregnancy where we know that there will be improved health outcomes with us knowing in advance. That is, for example, we know that babies with Down syndrome have a higher chance of having heart defects. Heart defects, unfortunately, are only detectable by ultrasound about 50% of the time. But if we know that we have a pregnancy affected by Down syndrome, we will get that patient in on the best ultrasound machine with one of the paediatric cardiologists to have a really careful check over the heart so that we reduce the chance of us missing a diagnosis that might be very important for that baby as it goes through neonatal care and planning perhaps even cardiac surgery in the future. In addition, there are things that might change in terms of management during the pregnancy or labour and delivery that might be importantly informed by the additional information we get through surveillance of the Down syndrome baby in the remainder of the pregnancy. And importantly for families, it gives them the opportunity to connect with support groups, to connect with paediatricians, to have conversations about early intervention, all things that will help that family through the unarguably difficult time through diagnosis right through to the time of welcoming their baby to home. When families come for an ultrasound, even with the best informed counselling before you have that test in the world, most families come with the expectation that they're gonna go home with a DVD, that they'll watch over and over again and torture the grandparents with, and they'll all play guess the gender for the next seven months or so. You can imagine how the rug is pulled out from them when they actually leave that room with a sense that everything is not perfect with their baby. And this is a real challenge for all of us to be responsive to the patient and her family at that time. We know from research what patients want at that time. What they want is clear, accurate, unbiased information about what we know and what we don't know, what it will mean for the pregnancy and what it will mean for the health and development of their child. So in practical terms, you can imagine that this is often quite a chaotic situation for um, a woman whose partner may or may not even be with her at the time of that ultrasound and the diagnosis being made. In practical terms, we take them into a quiet room, we give them a cup of tea and a phone and an opportunity to ring someone or get them on speakerphone or get somebody in to be with her or offer them a pastoral care support person as we start to unravel what this diagnosis might mean. We know that families appreciate the input of experts in the area. They value that over anything. And so for that reason, in our unit, in our fetal medicine unit, for example, we will have a genetic counsellor available all the time who will see those patients immediately. But then they will also involve usually one of us, a fetal medicine specialist, a paediatrician, a geneticist in the first instance, as we walk through the early phases of what the findings were in the scan and what we think this means. You can imagine that at this disclosure interview, the ability of any human to be able to recall and process all that's been given to them is very difficult. And we know by the time we've got to the lift, they've remembered 10% of what we've said. And I say that to all patients. I say, I know by the time you leave here, you will only remember 10% of what I say. If you don't remember anything else, the only thing that matters is that it's not your fault, it's nothing you did, it's nothing that you didn't do, and you're gonna to need to see us a lot and ask the same questions over and over again until you feel like you're sure about the information we're giving them. So that disclosure interview will vary in its length because it will depend on the patient's circumstances. A patient I saw yesterday, for example, with a prenatal diagnosis of spina bifida, I heard was a victim of domestic violence, is evicted from her home, she doesn't have the bond to find rental assistance with her other three children. 
The key priority for that woman, of course, was getting social work involved, pastoral care support, and the disclosure interview about the nature of the abnormality was necessarily quite short. But with all families, we aim over time over a series of consultations and getting in the necessary experts to be able to provide them with the information they need about the baby they are carrying. And the questions that families have most commonly centre around why did it happen, with very often the mother owning some of the guilt about why her baby wasn't formed perfectly. And so it is important to dispel those myths, but also to work out as best we can what do we think was the underlying cause. Very often, these are random events at a time when a cluster of cells were meant to assume a certain position in the developing embryo that just didn't quite make the connection at the right time. They are random developments. They're not associated with another underlying problem, such as a genetic syndrome, for example. But there will be some situations the example we just referred to before, for example, where, for example, the detection of the cardiac abnormality might be the first sign of a chromosomal or genetic problem, such as Down syndrome. So in those situations, it's important for us to talk through with families, what's the likelihood that this might be part of a broader spectrum where there'll be important information for the baby's health and development that might be obtainable from getting further genetic information? So you can see those first couple of weeks after the time of a diagnosis of an abnormality is very important to information gathering time. If it's a kidney problem, we will hook them in with kidney specialists at the children's hospital. If it's a heart problem, we'll get a cardiologist in so that families feel like they've got enough information to go forward with the confidence that they understand what the problem is and what the implications are for the future. The next question they'll want to know is what next? What does this involve for the future of the pregnancy? And this will also encompass conversations about problems in a baby that might have specific risks to the pregnancy. For example, we know that some conditions are associated with a higher chance of the mum developing preeclampsia or the mum having a higher chance of an early birth. And it's important that we discuss with families what surveillance we're going to offer the mum for those complications during the pregnancy. And also, we'll be saying, what are going to be the implications for the baby? For example, there's an abnormality called gastroschisis, where the front wall of the abdomen hasn't formed properly and the bowels are all sort of sitting out in the amniotic fluid. We know this is associated with an increased chance of babies not growing well. And so for those babies, we'll be offering very close surveillance of growth during the later part of pregnancy. So we need to, if you like, give a road map. We can't predict exactly what will happen during the pregnancy, but we can give families a realistic understanding of what the pregnancy might be like. Will they need to stop work early? Should they be getting carers leave for their partner? Should they be organising to deliver in a tertiary centre, for example, where there's neonatal intensive care facilities available? Or would it be an option for them to deliver closer to home and closer to their family? And then they'll want to know what happens to the baby after it's born. This, of course, will be hugely dependent on what the problem is. You can imagine that the baby with the abdominal wall defect goes straight to the children's and has surgical closure straight away. But there'll be some things, for example, genetic conditions, where we'll be saying, look, it will be important for us to plug you in to the follow-up clinic and to make sure that you have all the available resources to manage what might be problems in subsequent years but won't be immediate problems at birth. And then, of course, for all families, all parents, what we want to know is will our kid read a book, kick a ball, get along with its mates? They're the questions that families most often turn to us and say, what does the long term hold? And we have to be honest with families and sometimes say, we are polishing the crystal ball, but we're a little bit unsure. But we will give parents the best advice we can on what we think the long term future holds for them, for this baby and for their family. I'm conscious that this is a video that we're filming to help people reconcile the issues related to biomedical ethics. And I think the things that we've talked about have broadly touched on the areas of justice and beneficence and respect for autonomy. But I think in a very real way, perhaps what we've talked about today is the important part of holding a candle in the dark for families who find themselves in a place they didn't expect to be facing a diagnosis potentially of a complication in their pregnancy, an increased risk of a preterm baby, 
a baby with a structural or genetic abnormality and there are lots of challenges where we need to hold their hand and say we will partner with you to find a way through and to give you all the information surrounded by compassion. And I guess I find this entirely consistent with the Catholic ethos, that we are advocates for the vulnerable in these situations, that we are called to be kind, to be compassionate, and perhaps mostly that we are asked to act justly, to love tenderly and to walk humbly. So best practice that we've been talking about today in terms of care for pregnancy, but which incorporates elements of screening that includes screening for genetic and structural abnormality, is now recognised as best clinical practice. And as a Catholic health organisation, it is imperative that we provide best clinical care. This is in the interest of the patient and her family and her having trust in us as a Catholic institution that she will have access to full, informed, clear information about the future of her pregnancy. But it is also important for us as a Catholic institution that we have the trust of our peers in this area of medicine, that they know that there are no exceptions to providing best clinical care and offering best practice just because you're in a Catholic hospital.